Okay. So welcome, everyone, uh, to my session uh, today on um, dynamic migrations using uh, templates like this between uh, quotes. Um, my name is Daniel Shiposh. I am. Um, I mean, I run a web omelet. Uh, it's the blog where I should be uh, actually <laughs> writing more. Um, I also uh, wrote this book, of which I have a copy today, uh, for someone who will answer a question uh, correctly, let's say. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, so, what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to go through a bit of a, th uh, bit of a of theory around migration, the migration API, uh, also a bit outside of Drupal, um, and then see how this works in Drupal, essentially. Um, then we're going to actually talk about what the migration is uh, uh, from a Drupal point of view, a bit of, a, a bit of an introduction to the ecosystem, kind of like who, who are the guys there. Um, and then we're going to, to to see two main examples, right? We're going to do a basic migration to to illustrate these concepts um, to begin with. So this is going to be a simple one. Uh, we're going to migrate some taxonomy terms. Obviously, we're not going to do any live demos, so okay, <laughs> that doesn't work. And then we're going to go to the more advanced topic of, of dynamic migrations using these so-called, what I like to call templates, uh, but which are not. Uh, <laughs> So uh, all of the code that you, you will see in these slides is going to be is there on, in that repository, along with uh, a lot of other uh, stuff um, regarding migrations and plugins, etc. So definitely do check that out. You can set up a site very easily just by running a couple of commands using Docker. Um, we are actually using the uh, yeah, it's okay. So before we, we get into, into, the, into the meat of the thing, <coughs> I'd like to clarify what I mean by the word templates, because uh, definitely don't think about real templates from a Drupal point of view. There's no tweak going around. Um, they were, uh, in the early Drupal 8 days, they were, we were talking about templates because they were config uh, based. Uh, but now, actually, um, they are plug-in derivatives. So that's going to be the main topic uh, towards the end that we're going to, to, to talk about. Um, but yeah, before they were used mostly for Drupal to Drupal migrations. Okay, so outside of Drupal first, what uh, what what are we talking about when we are when we are when we are discussing about migration, right? So um, a, a very important concept when it comes to data migration, something that is found uh, a lot in like data warehousing and things like this, outside of my uh, above my pay pay grade. <laughs> Uh, is the extract, transform, and load procedure. Right? ETL for short, I will be referencing it uh, like that for now. So what does, this, uh, what does this entail? So essentially it's made of three parts, uh, three steps actually, for, for getting data from one place to another, right? Uh, so the assumption is that you have data in one place in the source, right, the source data, that you need to get to a destination. Um, so how does that happen? Well, in these three steps. So the first one is I mean, it's all written there. <laughs> the first one is reading uh, the data from the source, extracting it, and understanding it, right? Uh, that data can be many, many different shapes or forms, uh, many different places, etc. So the first step is being able to understand that data. Uh, the second step is uh, cleaning it, transforming it, shaping it, modeling it for the new application, the destination where it's going. So uh, that's a very important part uh, that uh, we always have to do because usually we are migrating old legacy stuff to, to newer, hopefully improved architectures. And the, the third step is the load phase. Well, the load is a bit um, <laughs> weird to say, but essentially saving the data into the destination, right? So there are specificities to that destination application, and this step is responsible for, uh, for after the data has been transformed for saving that. Uh, so I put save in parentheses because load for us in Drupal kind of does it means the opposite. But okay. so some of the some of the aspects of this uh, or characteristics of this of this procedure are uh, that 
you can have multiple sources, right? So you don't necessarily have or bound to only one source. You can aggregate multiple sources. And the fact that these three steps are separate allows to, to, to do this. Um, the, the architecture of this, uh, of this source, so that the model, actually, actually the data model of this source data can be different and usually is different and should be different than the one in the destination, right? We typically encounter old, old stuff and we want to get it into new, better uh, applications. So imagine uh, migrating from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8. You're not going to want to have the same content types, the same exact fields, um, because <laughs> that's not good. Uh, and obviously, for, for the second step of this procedure, uh, where that comes a lot into play, is that the source data can be really dirty, inconsistent, makes no sense, missing parts, you know, uh, things like that that we need to kind of take care of. So, now we go into, into Drupal and see uh, step by step how this uh, ETL is actually reflected in the architecture of, of the migrations in Drupal. Uh, so one of the, the, the first things that we, we need to talk about uh, before we, we kind of cover these three steps that I, I had uh, referenced, let's see what is a migration in, in Drupal speak. Basically, it's a YAML-based plugin, right? Everybody knows what plugins are. Everybody who knows what the plugin is and can give at least one example, can you raise your hand, please? I'd just like to see. Excellent. Perfect. Uh, so for, for the rest, um, plugins are essentially uh, encapsulated bits of functionality which are obviously reusable but more importantly swappable. Uh, so for example, a subsystem uh, can define a plugin type uh, in order to perform a certain task, right? But that task can be performed in one or ten different ways. And usually, in Drupal at least, a user will, will choose, okay, how that task should be performed. So imagine a field, for example, a field display, formatter. This field, I want to render it like this, and this other field, I want to render it like this, right? So I have two plugins for this. And the user, when it configures the field type, <coughs> specifies which field uh, formatter to use. Um, <coughs> the YAML part of this uh, thing, um, I'd like to also uh, mention, is that most plugins uh, in Drupal, well, many plugin types in Drupal, uh, plugins in Drupal 8 are discovered by, um, uh, by way of annotation. So that doc block, weird doc block above the class that uh, contains the plugin. But these are YAML based plugins. So that means that the entire definition is, is I mean, it's in the YAML files declarative. It's, it's there, there's not, um, we don't actually write necessarily PHP, we don't have to necessarily write PHP code for them. There's a, there's a few examples. Um, uh, in core uh, of YAML based plugins, for example, uh, menu links, right, uh, that are uh, be defined in YAML. We will get back to this example a bit later. So, what does the, the migration contain? Now that we know what the plugin is, etc., in this YAML file, essentially we orchestrate this whole ETL process. So, we, of, of course, apart from some metadata information, ID, label, we will see things like this. We also have the crux of the matter is the definition of these three steps of the ETL process. Um, and these uh, take the form of other plugins, uh, plugin types, namely the source, process, and destination. I'm sure you can already kind of map these three things to the, to the concepts in ETL. So we have the source, which deals with first step, reads, and the process, which transforms, and the destination, which uh, loads or saves. We will cover them individually in the next slides. Uh, so, essentially, the migration uh, plugin um, configures these three things. Um, in addition to that, of course, there's some other things underneath that are important for the process, such as keeping a, a map uh, of IDs of source data versus uh, destination data, so the system can know later on, okay, this source item maps to that uh, entity, etc. Um, yeah. So. Let's talk a bit about this is a very small, a very small slide. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk a bit about uh, these three plugin types uh, that that come into play. So, as we were, uh, as I was uh, mentioning before, the first step of the process is uh, the data, the source data that we need to move to the other place. So, the most important, the two biggest things that the source plugins do, uh, and that's in bold there, 
is read this data. That's one. Understand it, yeah, um, and iterate over it because usually data is in in uh, sets of records, so we have to iterate over them. So the source plugins uh, are able to do this, and they are able to do this for various different data types, right? So you can have CSV, as we will see uh, later down uh, in the slides. We have SQL, JSON, XML, what have you, text files, spreadsheets, doesn't matter. Um, there are source plugins for those things, and if there are not, you can write your own. That's the another brilliant part of the Drupal 8 plugin system is that when it's missing, you write your own neatly uh, encapsulated bit of logic that you just plug into the thing, and it, well, it doesn't always work, but it works. So uh, there are uh, a lot of source plugins available already, like for example, for CSV, uh, for SQL. There's there's stuff around JSON as well, XML. Um, but yeah, you can obviously write on your own as well. Now, the process plugins. These are the fun ones, right? So once the source data has been read, right, record has been understood, it's being passed to the process plugins. Um, there are three main things that the process plugins do. Um, the first one is that they map the data values to the, our Drupal fields, right? So <clears throat> imagine we have a content type with fields, and then we have, we will keep with the CSV example as we go forward, just for the sake of illustration and ease of explanation for me. Uh, so imagine a column, right? The value in one of the column records needs to go into this field. So the process plugin is there to map this value into the field. That's its most basic and critical function. Without that, uh, we would not have uh, migration. So uh, we need them at least for that. Um, then we have um, the transformation of the data and the preparation. So for example, we can break it up into multiple values. We can do, <coughs> excuse me, we can do all sorts of whatever, uh, whatever we, we want on the data uh, to then send it to the destination. So we have this preparation uh, as well available. The third one, we can also clean the data, right? Uh, we can perform um, these kinds of alterations, like uh, replacing values, uh, you know, uh, parsing stuff, uh, turning, you know, <laughs> markdown into HTML. <laughs> of course, there are um, there are better ways of doing this than uh, directly in these plugins, uh, which is why I did not mention them on the slide. Uh, we had a training earlier this week on, on using the middle, uh, middle format approach by which we, we kind of delegate the, 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 this cleaning aspect to, um, to another system which is independent from Drupal so that whenever we, uh, we work with data in Drupal we are all, uh, always <coughs> adhering to uh, a known and uh, reliable contract of this uh, format of this data so that it's also testable and reviewable, etc., as it goes into Drupal. So basically, what's in that format needs to exist in Drupal as well. Uh, but you can also perform uh, these things in plugins. I have. So. Uh, another uh, aspect to these, to these plugins, which is uh, very, very cool, is that they are chainable. Uh, what, does this what this means is that uh, they can, uh, you can have multiple process plugins for the mapping of one single field. Meaning, <coughs> meaning that, no, Im imagine a pipeline, right, of things, of plugins, of, of process plugins. So in comes the source data, goes to the first plugin, performs the alteration, passes it to the next one, which receives the altered value already. And like this, you can, you can create, uh, you can really alter your data however you want. Uh, and we will see, I mean, these are definable in the migration panel. Finally, I mean, we have many plugins uh, already available in core. There's like a list like this we have in contrib. Uh, it's just a matter of looking what exists before writing your own. Worst case, you can super easily write your own. It's a method you need to implement inside of the plugin. Gets the value, you get, uh, you return the what, what you want that value to, to, to turn into. So it's actually really easy. Uh, you just have to be uh, creative. Uh, the destination plugins, once the data has gone through the process plugins, uh, are responsible for saving the data, right? They are closely tied to the website, so the application, they know the 
specificities of how that should uh, happen. So in our case, we're talking about mostly entities, con content entity or config entities that we are migrating into, uh, and they know how to save and uh, delete to when, when we roll back. So they are our use for that. You won't probably have to write your own. Uh, you use the core ones, and that's pretty much it. It just works. <coughs> Another part that I want to, to, to mention in this whole ecosystem, now that, okay, we have the, the migration, we've got the orchestration of the three plugin types. How does this thing work? Uh, how does it run? Uh, in comes this guy, uh, the migrate executable, <coughs> which does what it does. It executes the migration. Namely, it imports the stuff or rolls it back. Uh, and that's really, really cool because we have the opportunity to roll back as well to, the f uh, to a clean state uh, using that ID mapping that I mentioned before. Uh, so essentially what it does is asks the migration, give me the source plugin, it's the source plugin, <coughs> ask the source plugin for the data one by one, passes it to the process plugins one by one if we have chained uh, per record, right? And then once that comes back, asks for the destination to then save to the save it. Then rolling back, not the opposite, because it just needs to delete uh, the end result, but that's pretty much it. It also sets the status and messages and errors, things like that, in case we have uh, problems at uh, the individual record level. A couple of words about the ecosystem, because this is very important. Um, <coughs> without this, we don't really we, we can't have uh, simple migrations even, uh, so to speak. Um, so three guys I would like to mention here, um, Migrate Plus tools and Migrate Source CSV. The latter because I like it and because we are going to use it in example going forward. So the Migrate Plus module comes with a bunch of extra source uh, process plugins. Uh, so for example, string replace, skip on value, which are, I mean, imagine I'm, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to explain what string replace would do, right? So you just say what you want to replace and with what. And it's just declarative in the YAML file. Skip on value, skip a record if it has certain values or not. So I definitely urge you to check what's in there uh, for more examples of this. Another important um, feature, well, thing that it comes with is an, a source plugin for, uh, for URLs, basically for an endpoint. Um, whatever that may be, it can be a file, it can be an HTTP uh, endpoint, etc. But it comes with this source plugin that you feed it this endpoint, and then it provides two more plugin types in order to, to, to do something with this endpoint. So the data fetchers are, are able to, to retrieve the data from the endpoint. Uh, so for example, you can have a file data fetcher or a URL, like an HTTP thing or a directory, whatever. And then once that's been uh, brought in, we also have the parsers which are able to understand what's, what the fetcher has brought in. And there you have things like JSON, okay, maybe it's JSON, maybe it's XML, maybe it's whatever. Um, so with, with these two guys, we are able to, to, to fetch from whatever endpoints we want. <coughs> Migrate tools, um, actually, maybe we could get away without using Migrate Plus. But without migrate tools, uh, good luck, because it provides the drush commands uh, that we need in order to run the migration. So even if we wrote all of our nice little migration, we can't run it unless we write the code to run it. So programmatically, um, um, so it is uh, critical. Um, obviously, in order to do to do this, it extends the migrate executable and also provides some extra features like the ability to import only certain IDs from the source and things like that. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar from Drupal 7, in which we had a similar, uh, similar capabilities. Finally, um, Migrate Source CSV is an example of a very small module. <coughs> There's one thing, provides a source plugin for CSV, right? You give it a CSV file, well, the path to a CSV file, and this guy is able to read it, iterate over the individual records, provide the data, uh, and we will see how it actually works in practice. Okay, any questions so far? Well, maybe at the end. <laughs> now let's see how this actually works in practice with a very simple migration of this data. So we have a CSV file, as you can see. We have an ID column. 
Uh, doesn't matter for our purposes what these IDs are, but if if you if you figure out uh, how those IDs, the the pattern of those IDs, kudos. Uh, but we have two columns, right? We have label en and label ro. I'm Romanian, that's why. Um, and essentially, these are categories or whatever, right? Of of stuff, of food, and whatever product. Uh, so in the first migration, what we're going to do is create text, import these things as taxonomy terms in English. Forget for the moment the Romanian translations. We're going to get the English stuff in. This is the plan. We have a vocabulary. It's for now English. We'll get it multilingual later. Check out this repository. Three commands with Docker. You're up and running with the website, with the migrations in place, with all sorts of stuff in there, uh, just as an example, right? Um, including what we are doing now. And you can immediately just run the migration to see how it works. So this is what it looks like. Everybody can see. I'm not sure um, if it's big enough. I think it's big enough. Um, so migration, um, migrations, as I mentioned, go into YAML files <coughs> inside of, uh, of a module. Under the title there, I put where this file is to go. So under the, in the migrations <coughs> folder. And the file name is to be namespace with the module name, and then dot .migration, and then the ID of the migration which needs to be unique. And then inside, we proceed with the definition of, of this migration, right? So you can see it's all declarative. We don't have any PHP involved. And we start with things like, like metadata ID, label, group, so that we can group migrations later, uh, we run by group, <coughs> multiple migrations, etc. And then we have three, <coughs> three keys, right? Source, destination, process. I should have put them in the right order. Uh, the very first one, as you can see, is the source. This is where we define the plugin to be used as the source. We say CSV is the idea of the plugin. And then what's underneath is the actual configuration uh, uh, of that particular plugin. If we used another one, all of the, un uh, of the, the lines underneath would be different uh, because they are not specific to CSV. As you can see, you can understand already, OK, you have to say a path where the file is. Maybe there's going to be another one with path, but whatever. Then we have to say how many uh, rows are the headers in the file. Because you can have one or two or more. Uh, we just say that. We specify, OK, the, the, <coughs> the main key, the ID, which column is going to be the, the, the key for uh, the unique identifier for that record. And then we specify the column names, right? We have ID, label EN, and label RO, right? We kind of define, we tell it how the CSV file looks like. That's it. Then we have the destination definition in which very simply we tell Drupal, OK, save these guys into taxonomy term entities. So it uses, it's, it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, we don't have to tinker with this too much. And then we've got the process plugin. Uh, and we only have two very simple uh, mappings to do. First, I'm going to talk about this one first, which is the name. We want to use the label underscore en column, right? So that is the, the column in the CSV that we want just to copy over. Um, if we omit specifying a plugin, as we do above, we then don't have to, uh, we then uh, defer to uh, the get plugin, which essentially copies values over. It doesn't do any other alteration, just copies over. Otherwise, we specify what plugin we want this process to use for this field. And for the vit field, which is the vocabulary ID, we use the default value plugin, which says, OK, for all the records that you import, use this default value. And we want this value to be categories because we want the vocabulary to be categories. That's the name of the vocabulary. So all the records will have this. It has not, no bearing on the data source. <coughs> so this is pretty much it. Uh, as you can see, not rocket science. Uh, this can get more complex for sure. Uh, we can have all sorts of, uh, of plugins. Like for example, here we can put uh, an array of plugin definitions to make it chainable, and it goes down uh, down that uh, pipeline. That's it. We can run our migrate tools commands now. Uh, migrate status to see the available. Well, obviously, you have to clear the cache, <coughs> enable the module, normal stuff. Um, then we can see what migrations are available with migrate status and then import 
or roll back our migration, specifying which name. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much the basic migration. No PHP code. Okay. Just check the time. Okay. So we have now the migration in place. We ran it. We've got terms with our labels in English, right? Now we want the other column. Uh, we want to translate the the terms, right? We want to import the the Romanian translation. We don't want new terms. We want them to be translatable, translated. So, in come the plugin derivatives. What are they? So, plugin derivatives. We know now by now what a plugin is. Well, a, a plugin derivative is an instance of the same plugin, meaning that we can have dynamically uh, generated plugin instances of the same uh, thing. So they are defined statically, right? But they are, then they are enriched dynamically depending on the state of the application. So it's kind of like the like the hook info hooks in Drupal 7 when we had for each loops to to create multiple, like in hook block info, we would create more, core would create multiple blocks, depend, uh, would loop through existing entities and would create a block for each, right? Like menus, for example. Uh, and then, but in Drupal 8, it's object oriented, so we use a deriver class uh, to, to generate. Okay, so now I have a question for the room. Um, can anybody give me an example in, in Drupal 8 of, of plugin derivatives? Of, of usage plugin derivatives. Okay, I think I think you raise your hands first. Yeah, that's a lot of derivatives. Basically, when we need a, a specific plug, whether it's a plugin or something, we need to derivatives for our migration, right? Why don't we write another migration or whatever for, for this? So. Well, imagine we have 10 columns, 10 languages. We have 10 languages on the website. <coughs> We'd have to write them, copy the whole thing, write the migration for each. Not cool. Uh, also, I don't know if it would work. I didn't even try. Um, so, uh, But definitely would not be a fun exercise. So what we want to achieve uh, okay, what we want to achieve is that we define statically one migration and then enrich it with the available languages on the site so that we generate an instance of the same migration for each language. And then that instance will know which column in the CSV contains the data in this example. can have other examples, but in this one, that's what we're going to do. So then when we add another language, it automatically generates a new migration instance for that language. So how, how will this look like? Now we're going to look at some, some code because we need <coughs> um, also PHP aside from the migration. So next to the migration we wrote first, we, put, we have another one now called category translations, which is essentially very close in definition to the first one. So that's why I'm omitting some things here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the differences mainly. So the first thing you'll see is that we specify a deriver, which is going to be responsible for generating our migration instances, right? So that's going to be categories, language, deriver. We will see how that looks uh, in a moment. Second, for the destination, we just need to specify, and this is, has to do with multilingual aspects rather than migrations. Uh, rather than derivatives, is that uh, we have to tell it to save translations, meaning without this it would save new entities instead of trying to save on the existing entities as translation. This is part one. Part two, and we go to the process uh, part, uh, where the very first and most important thing you should notice is that we don't have the name. We don't know the name because we don't know the column that we have the name in for a specific language, right? That's the, that's the dynamic part. 
But we do have some other important things we need to define, such as uh, the TID, the taxonomy term ID, um, because we want the, the, the terms <coughs> to be added to the existing terms. So we need to map them to the previous migration. So for this, we use the migration lookup plugin, and we tell it, OK, check the ID uh, of the source, look in the, the mapping for the IDs, and put it in the same term as uh, as, a, uh, as you had previously said. Uh, so for that, we use the migration lookup plugin. Then, specific to, to multilingual entities, we have the content translation source, which uh, we need to fill in if we want translation. And for that, we put English for all uh, um, uh, records, because the, the source was English when we first translated. Then finally, we set the dependency on the previous migration, because this these migrations won't be able to run before having run the categories one. So uh, it's important to have this uh, dependence. Okay. Now we write the deriver. These are kind of like the bullet points of it. Goes in that namespace, as you remember. <coughs> it extends deriver base, as all derivers do uh, in, in Drupal. And then if we want to inject dependencies, which we do, we need the language manager. We need to implement the container deriver interface. Uh, and essentially, uh, we have one method that we need to implement, get derivative definitions, uh, which uh, gets the base plugin definition as, a, uh, as an argument. And that base plugin definition is essentially the array representation of this thing, right? The whole thing into, gets transformed into an array, and we receive it here so that we can enrich it. This is what that method looks like now. It's definitely not rocket science. We have the language manager already uh, injected. And then we start looping through all of the languages on the site, skip English because we had already migrated into English. And then we <coughs> create one derivative for each of the languages. We will see the method that does that in a second. And then return all the derivatives, right? So this is where the dynamic part comes into play because we don't know at any moment what languages there are on the site. So we loop through them and then we create one by one the derivatives. And this is the method that does the thing, does the actual deed of, you see, get derivative values. And we pass the, the base plugin definition and the language for which we want to make a derivative. <coughs> so here, we enrich the, the, the migration definition. As you can see, the, the structure is the same as we had in the YAML file. We have process, and then we have the mapping for the field name. Now. We have a language, so in, we have, in this context, we have the language. We know uh, what field, what column we want to look at. And the, we put that in the source, uh, def, uh, under the source key of the configuration of that plugin type, skip on empty, I will explain. Label underscore and then the language ID. So it will be label underscore RO. So it will look in that column. But uh, we use the skip on empty plugin, which, uh, to be honest, I don't remember where it's from, core or migrate plus. Uh, but it's very important in this case because if we don't have a value in the column for Romanian, so one of the things, one of the uh, records is missing, we don't want a translation to be imported. One, because it will have no name. Uh, and two, probably to break. So with this plugin, we say, OK, if it's empty, just skip the entire row. So that particular term will not have a translation, which is fine, right? Not everything has a translation. Had we not done that, we would have had uh, probably broken data at some point. And then another thing that we need to uh, <laughs> to, to migrate, uh, also dynamically, so you can see we only focus on the dynamic parts, is the language ID of the translation. So here, again, we use the language ID. And we said that for all records of this migration, we put that language ID. We're using the default value plugin we've seen before. Already. We just return this. And that's it. Now we can clear the cache, um, run the status. So if we run our status, we will see two migrations for our data source, because we have two languages. So we have the original categories migration, and then we have the categories underscore translation colon ro for the ID of the language, which I specified here. Yeah. So the, the derivative ID is made up of the main plugin ID, 
colon, the sub ID, I don't know, the ID of the derivative. Uh, so we'll have that. Now, if we add five more languages on the website and clear the cache and run the mi migrate status command, we will have five more instances of the same plugin. Even if we don't have the data in the CSV, we have the migrations. It will have no records, I think, <laughs> um, but we will have the migrations. And, and as we add stuff to the, to the columns, as columns to the, the CSV, translations for these terms, we can just import the migrations without having to do anything else. Uh, if we just use import all, it will first import the original trans uh, migration because the um, derivatives depend on that, and then it will import all the derivatives. And I think that is it. Just a couple of conclusions, and then we can ask uh, maybe some time for some questions. Um, first, migrations are awesome. Um, the power is unbelievable. Uh, it's just a matter of creativity, um, and we can we can do a lot of powerful stuff. And here I'm not talking about Drupal to Drupal migrations. Uh, I do not use that. I do not care for that. <laughs> Uh, even for simple sites, I will export my, sort of my data to a common uh, simple format, such as CSV or JSON, and then I will import that into to the Drupal 8 site, which is essentially a rebuild, no upgrades. Uh, it's super fast to set up migrations. I mean, this was simple for sure, but even I mean, we can go bigger, and yet it's still just as simple because it's just a matter of more fields. But other than that, um, and then you have a lot of process plugins to do all sorts of stuff. And then when it comes to to, to dynamic migration, so for example, this was one example. Multilingual is very important for a lot of people. Uh, also for me, uh, I work a lot at, uh, at the European Commission where we have 20 plus languages for, for the website. So there it's, it's important to keep things in mind. But there's other examples. For example, can uh, I had the use case of importing product variations, Drupal Commerce product variations. So based on attributes and uh, prices for various attributes that would generate migration. So it's just it's just there for, for using. And that's it, I think. Pro pretty much matched with the other room. Finishing it. So, any questions? Uh, yeah, so I'm going to run this. Huh? I was told. <laughs> so, yeah. You can uh, take the survey and join for the contribution. <coughs> So any questions? Yeah, and I'm, somebody just asked. <laughs> How do you deal with one-to-x migrations? For example, I once had a problem. I migrated the Drupal 6 side to Drupal 8, and the information architecture changed from visiting body fields to paragraphs architecture. So I wrote a migration that just teared apart the HTML from the body field but ended up having several entities as destination entities. So how do you deal with that? Uh, well, first, I recommend the part of breaking up the, the body field into multiple <coughs> values <coughs> to, to do it outside of Drupal 8, so before, um, to come to, to, uh, to, to a data format that is nice and clean and predictable. Uh, but then, once you have multiple values, you can explode them um, in, in using process plugins to save multiple uh, field values. So it's just a matter of, of, of configuring plugins for that. Can I, uh, I did that a few weeks ago. And Same I, thing? Yes. Uh, I'm an old Google website here, new one, and we use paragraphs. And it comes from a, from a database. So I just created two uh, migrations. One first one that created uh, paragraphs and then using the same ID, um, creating nodes and just attaching the paragraphs that were created a second before and attaching them. So it's actually very fast. Yeah, there's all sorts of ways. Uh, and the, the using, with, I mean, with looking up uh, between multiple migrations, you can connect these things a lot and you can break down into multiple migrations. As long as in your source you can, you can map them, uh, it's very, it's not that difficult. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I 
So actually my question is about the written uh, barriers, which have uh, kind of uh, multi-level hierarchy. And uh, for example, from Drupal 7. And actually, um, just for, for my point of view, it is really hard. Um, and the only one, the only possible way is to be written uh, the late, uh, like last level, uh, like a really deep one. Uh, and go uh, and migrate level by level um, to migrate the references between them uh, to Drupal 8. And, uh, but probably you have like more useful or convenient way to do that. Uh, you're migrating from Drupal 7? From Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Paragraphs. So in Drupal paragraphs 7 paragraphs. Multi -level paragraphs. Yeah. Are there, are there references? I don't, I don't remember. Are there references between the paragraphs in Drupal 7 uh, to reflect this hierarchy? Uh, yes, that gives us the same reference. Ah, okay, so then uh, that that's that's fine. So the the whole thing is that you need to get that data out in out of Drupal first of all, and keep these references. So you can have all the paragraphs in one single set as long as they can reference each other's uh, parents. Yeah, yeah, right. That makes sense. So okay. then you have that, and then in Drupal eight. Uh, you can uh, reference them again using that thing. So you you, you can use stubs as well in case the record has not been created. Uh, but as long as you map the parent yep. to use the same migration, so itself, uh, it should work. For example, I will the IDs, if anybody uh, recognized, the IDs represent hierarchy between uh, the terms. So in the repository that I referenced here, there is a process plugin by which I import these things and I uh, import them as hierarchical terms. And it works based on the same principle. I'm not 100% sure how the paragraph re referencing actually is, but I'm guessing the principles are the same. So in the process plugin, you can say, okay, look for the other one to, to mark as a parent. Um, yeah, I think one more question. Anyone? Yeah. yeah in the uh, migration YAML file, uh, I see a lot of uh, keywords what I can use in the source uh, uh, process registration plugin. Is there a cheat sheet, cheat sheet available what I can use? Uh, well, yeah, yes and no. Uh, so the source plugin definition is specific to the source plugin itself, right? So the very first thing you need to do is look in the code of the source plugin. This is always true for everything. First, you look in the code, see how that is built, and see what it expects. Some of the source plugins, other plugins as well, definitely the ones provided by Core, have documentation in, above the class of what they expect and how they can be configured. Contrib should have to um, not, sh don't remember the, this particular one, but typically in the doc block. And worst case, you just check in the code to try to, to fish it out. I know that the URL one from, um, um, and the data fetch, uh, the data parser from Migrate Plus did not have such great, <coughs> they probably didn't have the time to do it. Uh, so I had to fish out from the code, like how I, Fish, like how I navigate through the JSON array, but typically you'll have uh, you'll have some of this information. The doc blocks tend to give examples as well, anyway. Sorry. The doc blocks on the uh, plugins tend to give examples. Yes, they tend to give examples, especially the ones in core. Yeah, yeah. Uh, process and source plugins, and like. But I mean, yeah. There is a cheat sheet for the process plugins of. Uh, Drupal core and migrate uh, plus I think on Drupal the fork. Oh yeah. With all the uh, available process plugins. Yeah. Okay. To be honest, uh, I personally don't care uh, because I, those things can be outdated. Uh, they can be wrong. Um, the best advice I can give, always and usually for everything like this, is check in the code in the action, not even the comments, but see how it is built and what it kind of expects, mm -hmm. because then you also get an understanding of, of the internals of the thing, and you, 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 you'll be able to visualize it better in your head, how the things work together. And then next time you use it, you kind of know better rather than have to remember what 
that thing. Goes. This is why I don't I don't even know where this documentation. Is. So yeah. Uh, so I think that's it. It was till 11, right? Okay, one more, really quick. And uh, does, does the CSV uh, source plugin support multiple paths? Ah uh, yes. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can imagine that like putting all your translation in one CSV can be crowded at some point. So having like separate CSVs for each translation is more maybe convenient. So sure. Uh, could, could your uh, directive uh, solve that issue as well? Uh, to be honest, all the, def the definition that you can see here, you can also omit from uh, the static declaration and fill it in uh, in the derivative generation. So basically, when you, when you create the derivative, you can specify in which file the values for that language exist. So you can have files keyed by the name, by the language code, and just point to that file, you see, and then each, actually it's, you remove the path from there, uh, and here, here you add uh, in the base plugin definition source path, you put the path plus language code. And then of course you also have to specify which column, etc. but yeah. Okay, I think that's it because, uh, but I'm, I'm around so we can uh, we can we can talk more. <laughs>